So uh, I was not clear on what the point Shankar was driving at last week. And uh, after having some assistance from Mark and going through the contextual verses, what he's doing is arguing against Sankhya philosophy. Now, why is this important? So about 2300 BCE, Patanjali wrote the Yoga Sutras. Uh, this is the eight limbs of yoga, which includes uh, yamas, niyamas, asana, pranayama, etc. This has stayed in Hindu tradition, even up to today. So when you go take a yoga class at the local gym, it is part of that whole eightfold, eight-limbed path of yoga. When one really studies it, it is traditionally studied with a commentary by a fellow named Vyasa. This is not Veda Vyasa, the one who did the um, authorship of the um, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, this dude's much, much later. And he is a Sankhya. Now, Sankhya philosophy, it's, it, it too is even alive today. So my familiarity with it comes from having studied um, uh, Pandit Rajmani from the Himalayan Institutes commentary on the Yoga Sutra, which is contemporary. He's from the, uh, uh, and he, he bases his commentary on Vyasa. So what's the difference between the Vedanta and the Sankhya? The Sankhyas posit that each one of us is a Purusha, which is a little individual glob of consciousness separate. And there's prakriti, nature. These are words that, for example, the Gita borrows and the Advaita will borrow these words. They're very, very old words. And there's a kind of intelligence in prakriti. Prakriti becomes the cause of our bondage, nature, because Ignorance is inherent in it. But then property becomes the cause of our moksha, our liberation. Because the problem is this little purusha gets entangled with property, and then it has to go through the process of getting disentangled. So Sankhya philosophy attributes qualities of will, volition, and choice to the purusha. A little bit different. So these are the ideas that Shankara is pushing against. Did that make sense? Any questions about that? Are you all still online? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what are the distinctions between the Vedanta and the Sankhya philosophy? First of all, Vedanta says, no, there are not little individual globules of consciousness. Consciousness is one without a second. I am Atma Brahma. This self is Brahman, the ground of being of the whole universe. The feeling that I'm an individual is Ahankara. It's thoughts of self, it's jiva bhavana, it's the attitude or the feeling that I'm a person. Now, the uh, Raja yogis, the, the Sankhyas would say, Shankar is just a veiled Buddhist, see. No, this is the philosophy of the Upanishads. And Vedanta says that the natural world, Prakriti, is not 
real stuff. It appears like the images in a dream and therefore is inherently insentient. It does not choose, it isn't luminous, it isn't conscious. And that volition and choice are qualities of the mind and the intellect. Guna and karma, the various qualities of the mind and the force of the past. It's essentially mechanical, but there is a conscious entity, aham, I, which is independent, never touch, birthless, changeless, and deathless. Now, the Sankhyas would say something happens to this Purusha. It gets disentangled from Prakriti, and this bound Purusha is now liberated. The Vedantins say, no. The truth is, the self was never bound. My bondage is this deeply rooted conviction that I'm bound, that I think I'm my bond. The self is ever free. It's already free. What happens in the mind? I realize that I've always been free. I do not become free. There's no ontological change. No change in being. Oh, I'm this miserable creature and now I'm different. No. I realize what I've always been. So on a worldly level, I like to use the examples of Moses and Tarzan. Moses was born in Israelite, but he was raised by the daughter of Pharaoh thinking he was a prince of Egypt. When he discovers that he's an Israelite, his being does not undergo a change. But his understanding of who he is changes profoundly. Tarzan, raised in the jungle thinking he's an ape, when the European explorer comes and shows him he's not an ape, he's a man, he does not change in form. His body hair doesn't fall off, he doesn't develop an opposing thumb and start to walk upright. That's always been what he was, but his understanding of who he is changed profoundly. Likewise, for you and me, right now, the self and me is ever free. I can't get liberated. The self is ever free. My problem is one of profound misunderstanding. My problem is avidya, ignorance. Now, if my problem is an ontological problem, meaning a problem of being, I got to be fixed. I got to go through some sort of process to change my bound self into something else. But if my problem is ignorance, no amount of actions are going to change that. The antidote to ignorance is knowledge. If there be an action indicated, it is only investigation. So these are the differences in the two philosophies. Now, even today, 
you and I may be unconsciously thinking, I need to be fixed. I need to be changed from this kind of person into another kind of person. And what Vedanta is saying, no, get out. We say practice Sakshi Bhava, the attitude or feeling that I am the witness. Well, guess what? You can't become a witness. Actually, you are always the witness of your interior life. You just haven't figured that out yet. I am not sad. I am not happy. I am not peaceful. I am not angry. I am the knower of happiness, sadness, peace, and anger. So, back to what our text is dealing with knowledge and pleasure this whole idea of knowledge we're dealing with two kinds of knowledge the first knowledge the real knowledge with a big old capital r is the self evidence of I. How do you know you are you? You do not see, hear, taste, touch, smell, emote, or think yourself. Yet, yourself is self shining, why I'm Jyoti. Self evidence, why I'm Bhu. Now, if everybody has a self and the nature of the self is self luminous, guess what? Everybody already has that. The insight that happens in the mind is when I reflect on this fact. First, through indirect knowledge study of the scripture, the teaching from the teacher, through my own thinking. And finally, Nididhyasana, long and continuous meditation. I slow the mind down enough. The attentive faculty of the mind turned inward. Notice the knower. in the space between the thoughts. Everything has been negated. What's left? Well, me. And the mind can reflect on that. And it goes, oh, I'm not a person. I'm that grounded being. I am consciousness. Now that's a thought that goes by. So from the frame of ultimate reality, that's in my eye. Full of bondage and liberation occur to the mind. Self is everything. Now he's going to be riffing on what is pleasure. Pleasure is the mind ceasing its extroversion into the world and the mind comes home. Pleasure is a blissful mind. We call the self Ananda because it is the fountainhead of all happiness. Now listen very carefully. In the beginning, 
we will frequently make a distinction between worldly pleasure and the peace and bliss of your own self nature. Give up your attachment to worldly pleasure. Well, in the end, guess what? There's no such thing as worldly pleasure. It does not exist. The mind yoked to the self is what pleasure is. You either induce it with an object, or if you're a tyagi, one who can let go of everything, the mind will come home independent of the world. The world is shunyata, the world is void. So this discussion, where is pleasure, where is knowledge? Kind of depends on what we're talking about. And he's using this, this idea that a thing and its qualities can't really be separated. For example, it is the nature of fire to burn. It is the nature of sugar to be sweet. It is the nature of water to be wet. You can't separate wetness from water. You can't separate sweetness from sugar. You can't separate the burning from the fire. So what is knowledge? Well, it depends on what knowledge we're talking about. If we're talking about a knowledge of the self, there is that absolute knowledge, the fundamental self-evidence of I. That's an inherent quality of the self. If we're talking about that pratyabhijnana, that aha in the mind, that's an object of awareness. What is pleasure? The mind, when it's projecting out, unhappy. When the mind comes home, happy. Therefore, I see unhappy mind, happy mind, unhappy mind, happy mind. It is an object of awareness. But just like when the storms happen, and the waves of the ocean are mounting up big and they're crashing and they're violent and they're moving. But when the waves subside, the hurricane has passed and the ocean is still. Where did the waves go? The waves are merged into the ocean. The waves were nothing but the ocean appearing as the waves. And then they cease waving. They become the still ocean. So likewise, the mind when it's waving, ah, I'm so unhappy, or better different. And when it ceases, it's extroversion. It merges into the sea. So is happiness a quality of the self? Or the mind? It's a tough question to answer. So the Vedantins will use terms, one of my favorites, Brahman and Rasa. Rasa means juice, the taste. Mind comes home to the self by the, the taste. 
שמירה ותנ"ך. וכל The other term is Atma Ramana, from the root Ram Ramati, which means to rebel. To rebel in oneself. So this is the overall subject that Shankar is dealing with here. Any questions about all this? All right, what verse were we on last week? 54. Let's review 53. Let's do the English in 53 and then go on to 54. Okay. As other qualities are as other qualities also are different from one another, like knowledge and pleasure, they cannot be produced at the same time. If it be contended that the knowledge of the qualities is nothing but their coming in contact with one and the same self, we say no, for they are qualified by knowledge. So, if I am noticing the couch, I'm not noticing the trees outside. But it's different when it comes to the self. My swabhava, my self nature, is satjit ananda. Sat, I am. Chit, I shine as consciousness. When the mind has come home, I see ananda. I am this. I So in the self, they all are the same thing. Just like the same me can be the son of Richard and Helen. But I am the brother of Michael and Stuart. I am the uncle of Betsy. Wait a minute, make up your mind. Are you a son, a brother, or an uncle? Yes. Just depends on how one describes what he is. Now, when the mind is unhappy, the knowledge and the unhappiness, I know it. I is happy. Then the happy mind and the unhappy mind become objects of perception. Self is always inherently right. Next verse. Jnana neva visheshtvagya Gyanapyatum smrite statha sukham gyatam mayetyevam tava gyanatma kattvataha. Pleasure, etc., are surely objects of knowledge because they are qualified by it, and also on account of the memory, pleasure was known by me. Moreover, they cannot be known by being connected only with the self and not with knowledge. For the self is non-conscious as it is different from knowledge according to you. So the objector would say that the mind itself has inherent sentience. And here Shankar is saying, now wait a minute. When he says pleasure etc means pleasure, displeasure, and all those sorts of things. So I'm like the flashlight that knows all these objects. The 
various states of the mind are known by me. But consciousness is not known by me as an object. I know happiness and sadness, but I don't know consciousness and unconsciousness. I know the mind being folded up in deep sleep. But that is like when you close your eyes, you're not blind, you're seeing the back of your eyelids. You are always shining as knowledge. And the phenomena is always changing. Happiness, sadness, etc., are not qualities of this pure self. They're of the mind. Choice is not a quality of the self, it is a quality of the mind. Knowledge is not the inherent quality of the mind. Now the mind can know things. It is the nature of the mind to, we call it mind, when I illumine thoughts and feelings. I like to go back to Swamiji's spiritual algebra. What is the mind? Mind equals a, awareness plus thought flow, tia, vritti, doesn't matter what you call it. You take the thought flow, move it to the other side of the equal sign, mind minus thought flow equals pure awareness. The mind is not conscious. You are consciousness. The mind is not aware. You are awareness. You can illumine sensory perception. You can illumine feelings. You can illumine thoughts. When I'm illuminating thoughts, we call it intellect. When I'm illuminating feelings and judgments, we call it mind. When I'm illuminating sense perceptions, we call it the body, senses, uh, uh, ref uh, reflecting or contacting the world. That's all it is. All right, next verse. Sukha der natma dharmatva matmanaste vikarataha bheda danyasya kasmana manaso Pleasure, etc., cannot be the qualities of the soul as it is changeless, according to you. Moreover, why should pleasure, etc., of one soul not be there in other souls and also in the mind as, as difference is common? So the objector is still kind of being concerned about this, okay. If the self is ananda, bliss absolute, how come one person's unhappy and another person's happy? That would indicate that the self is changeable. It's because people don't understand what's meant by ananda. In beginning classes, I do not translate ananda as bliss absolute. I will translate it as no sorrow reaches there. That's a lot easier way to enter into it. Physical pain gets as far as my body, suffering gets as far as my mind, confusion and doubt get as far as my intellect, but none of it touches me. Then why don't we describe the self as such a chunta? Exists as consciousness and emptiness. 
Why do we call it Ananda? Because of the subtle understanding of what is happiness. Unhappiness is like the waves going up and down. Happiness is the waving ceases. Unhappiness is the projecting of the mind with kama, craving, spriha, longing, krishna, thirsting, vancha, wanting. All of that sucks. It hurts. Wanting to be in control. Raga, I want it this way. Devesha, I can't stand it. It can't be that way. It goes by many, many names, but it's all dukkha suffering. Basic problem of ego is it convinces me. The solution to my suffering is to get what I want. All Vedanta says is, how does that work out for you? Yoga says, understand what happiness is. Happiness is your svabhava, it's your self nature. How do I feel it in my mind? Let go. Heart open. So we call the self Ananda, bliss absolute, because when the mind is yoked to the self, it experiences bliss. It is blissful. So let's go to this word yoga. Yoga comes from the root yuj, which means to join. What gets joined to what? Does my crummy little personal self get joined to Brahman? Am I going to get glued on to God? No. I'm the drop, God is the ocean. There I am, this separate little soul, and I'm going to go, boom, into God. Oh. No. What gets yoked to what? The mind gets yoked to the self. And there's this wonderful image. You can Google it and look it up. I'm not going to pull it out now. Of Hanuman embracing Lord Rama. And it's always painted with Hanuman having just this blissful look on his face. For those Westerners, Hanuman's the monkey god. And he's got his arms around Lord Rama. And in most of the images, Lord Rama's embracing the monkey back, but he has a very neutral expression on his face. Kind of a benevolent, but neutral one. What's the mystic symbolism? The monkey mind. Hanuman. Finds its peace in the embrace of Rama, the Son. Swamiji used to say, Hurry home.
My problem is not one of being. My problem is one of knowledge. What's my problem? Ignorance. I do not know who I am. I do not know what I am. Where does that take place? In the mind. I'm confused as to my being. As the result of that confusion in the mind, I attribute to the self the qualities of the not self. And that impels me into all sorts of craziness, crazy behavior, crazy feeling, crazy thinking. And the mind then tells itself the solution is fix my being or play whack-a-mole with the world. Either I'm a terrible person or the world sucks. Bang, 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 bang. The doctor says, no, the problem is ignorance. Strike at the root of the ignorance. In one of my favorite hymns of Shankara, the Nirvana Shatakam, the refrain is Chidananda Rupam Shiboham Shiboham. I am of the form of bliss consciousness. Yeah, I am Shiva. I am suspicious. That's because I do not know. Next verse. I think you're muted. Okay. Sian ma la pariharyatu yanam chechi. Change Kiryatam Prajit Yoga Padva Pichat Tat Patil Hu Petat Ishate. If knowledge be the object of a second knowledge, a regresses ad infinitum is an inevitable. If, however, a simultaneous production of the two knowledges from one single contact of the mind with the self be admitted, you must accept the simultaneous production of color, taste, smell, etc. from the same contact. So the question here is, is the mind conscious? Well, kind of yes and kind of no. So the issue is, do I illumine consciousness, awareness? If so, then I've got one awareness, who illumines another awareness? Well, then is there another awareness behind that that's illuminating be that? And then there's another one behind that illuminating that? No. And here he's also striking at that Shunyavadin, the scolis of the void notion, that consciousness itself is also impermanent. Oh, there is consciousness. I'm aware of it. Now I'm the deep samadhi gone. 
If that be so, then who knows that it's gone? What confuses us is this phenomenon called chit chaya. Chaya means reflection or shadow. So in the subtle intellect, there's the reflection of consciousness caught in the web of thought. And when there are people here in class, in person, in the evening especially, I'll turn on this LED light and I'll bring out my little mirror. And then I'll catch the reflected light from the LED lamp and I'll turn the mirror around and shine people's faces. And then I ask the question, is there a light in the mirror? The mirror can certainly shine in your face, but there is no light in the mirror. But it is the nature of the mirror to reflect light. Likewise, the subtle intellect has as part of its quality the capacity to aim its attention at things, i.e. Jim can know the pillow on the couch. Now, i.e. Jim know the fern in the bay window. Is it the self that's moving hither and thither? i.e. Jim just heard the bus go by. Consciousness striking the subtle intellect. There's a reflection of it. Just like if I had two mirrors, I could shine one mirror over there and one mirror there. The light from the lamp reflects in each one of the mirrors. Are there two lamps? No, there's only one lamp. And this is what confuses us. This is what contributes to the sense that I'm an individual conscious being with a consciousness that seems to change. For example, if the mirror is not a flat surface, the light in it looks distorted. Or the one I like, you go to a fancy restaurant and after you've finished your business, you go wash your hands and the mirror over the sink is tinted and it's all indirect lighting. Oh, my complexion looks so good. <laughs> oh. It's the mirror. distorts the image. So it seems like I Jim happy, sad, successful, a failure, smart, stupid. All right. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Anavasthantaratvacha bandhonatmani vidyate na shuddhi chapya sangatva sango vidyacha shruteha. 
There is no bondage in the self as there is no change of condition in it. There is no impurity in the self as much as it is unattached, as the Shruti says. So, back to our Sankhya philosopher. The Purusha is bound by its entanglement with nature, Prakriti. It's all in pure. So what do we have to do? The Sankhyas say we have to beat up the nasty old matter to get it out from the Purusha, to fix it, to purify it. Shankara says, no, there is no bondage of the self. There is no impurity in the self. Don't believe him. Don't believe me. Stop. In a quiet mind, turn the attentive faculty within and notice the knower. You tell me what you see. Chidakasha, just the space of your awareness. Empty, vast. Be shunham. Extremely pure, there is nothing there. Yet it's being itself. So what Shankara is thundering, the self does not get liberated. The self does not get purified. Both bondage and liberation occur to the mind. The self is ever free. What is my bondage? I'm in ignorance. In the mind, I do not know who and what I am. Because of that, I attribute to the self the qualities of the not-self. What is realization? Moksha. The firm conviction in the intellect based on direct experience. Not that I am now a liberated Purusha and I used to be a bound Purusha. But, oh, I was so effing stupid. How could I have thought? I was a person. Where did it go? It's gone. I have always been Brahman. Just like when you awaken from a dream, did your dream body get liberated? It wasn't even real. Next verse. Sukshmeka go to re pesha na lipyat itishuteha. The self is eternally pure as it is beyond the mind and speech, one only and without any attributes. As the Shruti says, it does not get attached. So, the Sankhya philosophy, we do not agree with. The self is ever pure. The self was never bound. Just like no matter how tumultuous my dream is, I the wake. I'm safe and sound in my bed. Now, we never say that it's not a real experience. To 
just like I experienced the dream. But what is the dream? It's just imagination. So also the apparent bondage of the self is nothing but imagination. It's a kind of thinking, which is why I love Godapada's language, jiva bhavana. Jiva means the sense of being an individual. Bhavana means an attitude, a feeling. It's the feeling that I person. But that feeling that I'm a person can only exist when I don't look at it. If I introvert the attentive faculty and investigate what I think is an individual person, Oh, um, who am I? As Ramana Maharshi says, it falls. That means it doesn't tip over and fall down. It, it's not there. I don't find a gym inside. I find Brahman. What verse are we on now, Aditi? We're on 59. Okay, 59 for you. I think this is where we get the objector. Yeah. Evam tarhina mokshosti bandha bhavat bandha bhavat katham chana shastra narthakya me vasyan buddhe Pranti Rishyate Bandho Mokshascha Tannashaha Sayatokto Nachanyatha. Objection. If this be so, in the absence of bondage, there cannot be any liberation, and the scriptures are therefore useless. Aha! So. Oh, here. there's a reply as well. I'm sorry? There is a reply as well. Okay. The reply says, no, bondage is nothing but a delusion of the intellect. The removal of this delusion is liberation. Yes. Bondage is nothing but what has been described. Yes. So one has to be very careful of the non-dual Vedanta logic loop the rationalization of my suffering. Okay, according to you Vedantins, bondage and liberation are illusions. Therefore, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to shoot some heroin because it's all an illusion. I'm just going to scream and yell at my wife or husband. Why? Because it's all an illusion. I'm just going to go ahead and rob the bank. It doesn't matter. It's an illusion. And lots of people think they understand by just mouthing the words, it's all an illusion. And the fact is what they've done is rationalize their suffering. Remember the first noble truth of the Buddha. Life the way most of us live is suffering. How do I get out of it? Vedanta would say, you need not worry about fixing yourself, mainly because the self you're trying to fix is an impermanent temporary shadow. It's like going back to the first Star Wars movie when R2-D2 projects Princess Leia. And what if Luke Skywalker says, girl, I don't like your hairdo. 
I think you need to let your braids down. And he reaches over and tries to undo her hair braids or, you know, her buns on the side of her head. How's that going to work? There's nothing there. But an optical illusion, a virtual reality, a hologram. This is why all of our attempts to fix the ego don't work. What is bondage? Bondage is a mental state. Bondage is the deeply rooted conviction that I am bound. Why? Because I think I'm my body and the mind's reactions to the environment. That condition does not touch the self. I can talk to the most miserable of creatures. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm suffering. I'm miserable. I'm having a terrible day. Sorry to hear that. Do you exist? Yes, I exist. What's your existence like? Miserable. Do you know the misery? Yes. I am. I know. That miserable person does not lack the direct experience of the self. Experience suck, experience chip, but they experience a whole lot of mental stupidity. What is the duration? There is no other liberation than the buddhi, the subtle intellect, becoming buddha, awake. What does it do? It awakens to what is. This is woke with a capital W. And that doesn't affect or change the self. Another story I like to tell, there's a person living in a tiny little apartment, barely able to pay the rent, no car, cooking food on a hot plate, living in penury. They do not know that a distant uncle died and left them millions of dollars. The estate has been trying to locate them. They are a multimillionaire, but they do not know it. Because they do not know it, they cannot enjoy it. Likewise, you and I are birthless, changeless, deathless, always safe, always secure. It's always okay. You already have everything. Me. This is the self. But because in my mind I do not know, I think I'm living in the tiny little one bedroom, one, one room apartment called my body. And I don't have this and I don't have that. And I cook on a hot plate on a good day. I think all my happiness comes through the feeble senses. I 
have such a liberal life that we can say. And in truth, bitch, that my wives hands just won't work. So what did the scriptures teach us? First of all, the scriptures say, become a fit student. Then start this process of Atma Vichara, investigation into the nature of the self. You will gain nothing new, but you will realize treasure you always have been. Because you now know it in the mind of Uru, the benefit itself. Will this change the self? No. Still, just as Sthita, still standing watching. Found changes the mind. How many more verses in this chapter now? Um, quite a few? Yes, quite a few. Okay, let's do one more verse and then we'll quit for today. Bodhatma Jyotisha Deepta Bodhamatmani Manyate Bodhir Nanyo Sti Bodhiti Seyam Prantir Hi Dhigata Illumined by the light of the self, which is pure consciousness, the intellect falsely believes that it is itself conscious and that there is no one else which is so. This is delusion. It is in the intellect. Yes. Where is the locus of delusion? In the subtle intellect. What is the delusion? The intellect thinks it's chit chaya, it's reflection of self is chit, is consciousness itself. I have a nose, I have an elbow, I have feelings, I have thoughts, but I do not have consciousness. Being and consciousness are not separate. I am consciousness. I do not have consciousness. Consciousness does not change. We hear frequently states of consciousness. No, I have states of mind, which I is. But none of those changes touches how do I fix, how do I heal this ulcerated mind that keeps getting all caught up in the trap? Swamiji would say, shut up and get out. Stop the stupid storytelling of the mind. Stop it. Get out. Have the shift in identity. If I think I'm a person, I'm deluded. 
drop the problem I'm ruminating over and drop the person who's all worried about. Get out. The way to heal the mind is to get out of the mind. What will satisfy my mind? Not making other people do what I want. Come home. Go of the city's rape and come home. All right, good place to stop today. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Thank you all. Thank you, Aditi.